Chapter 26 of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers by Simon Landis. Chapter 26 Thrilling and Demoniacal Plotting of the Conspirators The bloody conspirators had now increased their number of members largely, and a special meeting had been called for Wednesday evening, sharp at eight o'clock, in Tabernacle Hall. Reverend Joe Pyer, the president, in the chair, who called the members to order when the doors were securely locked, and business was commenced. Deacon Rob Stew was the first man who took the floor, and spoke as follows. Beloved saints, I have a great deal to say to you this evening that is to be kept sacredly secret, and I therefore again assert that if there is any chicken-hearted brother or sister present, whoever it is, he or she may at once be removed. Will the President challenge the new members, who are not so fully indoctrinated into our plans and mottoes as is necessary? Certainly, brothers do. I will do as you say. For you all know that I tremble when I think of the arduous work that it is our holy mission to fulfill. Therefore I order all the members to rise to their feet, and repeat our pledge after me, responded Reverend Joe Pyer. After the terrible oath was repeated by each new member separately, the reader knows what that oath is, has read it in the second chapter. Deacon Stew continued, Feeling again safe in confiding my bloody plans to your hearts and hands, I shall briefly state what I have secretly learned, and what I propose shall be done. I say shall, because I am ordained by the Church to see to financial and secular matters as well as to assist in conducting religious worship. Dr. Juno has again escaped us, which is the most unfortunate thing that could have befallen the saints, and he has already advertised to speak in Concert Hall next Sabbath evening. But I have fixed matters for him already, so that he will be locked out of the hall when his hour for discourse appears. I have managed this through the Young Men's Association, who have great influence with the proprietor of Concert Hall. But whilst this will deprive him from speaking on that occasion, it will not stop him from trying it elsewhere. Moreover, he has a small hall of his own, where he holds his physiological lectures to the sexes. But I am sure I have a plan in view which will entrap him, if it is rigidly carried out by our religious people, and by the secret conclave. It is this. We must have the cry vigorously circulated, far and near, that Victor Juno is an awful rue, who has proved such already in public esteem by the reputation we gave him, by the seduction of, and elopement with, Miss Lucinda Armington. Therefore we shall hire a few fascinating single ladies who must go to his medical office for professional advice, and endeavor to get him to make improper advances towards them, and if they cannot succeed, will, nevertheless, be willing to swear before a public tribunal that he insulted them. I do not think that such a plan will work successfully, but why not concoct some method by which we can either imprison or hang him? said Dr. Toy Pansy. No, sir, your plan would be dangerous at present, for we dare not make too many bold attempts at his life so closely together because you must all know that the people are looking sharply on, and when they should find out that this man was being too roughly handled, they might arouse the hue and cry, Persecution and Republicanism subjugated, which might cause mob law and rebellion, a thing we shall avoid by quietly, but cunningly, working in the way I have proposed. However, I have not given you my whole plans as yet. Dr. Juno is not a suspicious man, but a fearless dog. Hence, several married ladies should be hired to visit his medical office also, and seek domestic advice, and if they cannot induce him to make improper overtures to them, they must, nevertheless, go home to their husbands, and for this purpose we must select handsome women, whose husbands are already jealous of their wives, and who are not afraid to shoot him, and tell their jealous better halves that Dr. Juno grossly insulted them, and if they had not accidentally escaped him, they would have been ruined, said Deacon Stew. I have a still better plan, responded Dr. Toy Pansy. That is, a plan that is more likely to succeed, and will be far more plausible. 
it must be very certain that dr juno needs money for we have already impoverished him by our past course and he is heavily in debt which he dreads awfully therefore we should send some unprincipled females to him with five hundred or a thousand dollars apiece to offer him for producing abortion on them which very likely he would do he is skilful in surgery and should undoubtedly conclude that this would be an easy way of making large sums of money this is the best plan interrupted sister nancy clover and afterwards arrest him and have him sent to the penitentiary for twenty or thirty years which would ruin him thoroughly and forever even though he should be pardoned by some weak-minded governor oh holy sister nancy clover you are such a deep saint that my soul swells when i hear you sanction such safe and cautious plans said rev joe pyre i have still another plan should he again attempt to speak in a large public hall where we should fail to control the proprietor thereof and you will all agree with me that it will succeed in convicting him for a misdemeanor that gives him one year in the county prison and five hundred dollars fine dr juno publishes and sells several medical books one of them is on the physiology of marriage and we can readily cry it down as an obscene publication and all we have to do is to apply to our good-natured and sincerely pious mayor who will arrest him just before he steps on the rostrum to preach and convey him to the central station where in some rude cell he will stay until the following monday morning because there will be no officer there on sabbath evening to give him a hearing or take bail by the morning following all the newspapers will delight in filling their columns with the arrest of dr juno for selling obscene books and giving indecent sermons said deacon rob stew excellent excellent most excellent exclaimed sister nancy clover and added and i am sure if we can once get him before a grand jury he will be indicted forthwith and our exemplary district attorney charlson who is a member of several leagues of pious and republican orders will work for his conviction with all his pious shrewdness and we can easily manage to get judge sanctiblor on the bench who will conspire with the district attorney charlson and rule out all of dr juno's testimony misconstrue the law to the jury and sentence him to the full extent of the law and deem it a religious duty becoming the elect mr president and brothers and sisters i am a tyro in this work of devilry which you are conspiring to carry out under the cloak of holy religion now whilst i shall not violate my oath which i have been compelled to take this evening i nevertheless am not willing to cooperate with you in the fulfilment of this nefarious work said henry gossamer earnestly and with a derisive countenance great mars may i never live to see to-morrow if this wretched apostate shall leave this hall to-night until we settle his benignant conscience furiously exclaimed deacon rob stew such miserable devils as brother harry gossamer should learn to understand upon what ground they stand when they enter our secret order sir mr rob stew need not fear that i shall betray the holy saint whom i now behold in his true colours cease your sarcasm furiously exclaimed deacon stew interrupting the speaker whilst he continued mr president i order this vile apostate to be at once arrested tried convicted and sentenced by this court of secrecy according to our oath what say the brothers and sisters arrest him arrest him was the unanimous cry when he was pounced upon by the entire brotherhood who knocked him senseless to the floor and cast him into their dungeon end of chapter twenty six recording by todd Chapter Twenty Seven of the Social War of Nineteen Hundred, or the Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Social War of Nineteen Hundred, or the Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter Twenty Seven: General Armington Turns Insane. Just as General Washington Armington fired, Dr. Victor Juno knocked the pistol aside, when the bullet barely grazed his skin. But the general, not satisfied, immediately attempted to shoot again, when Dr. Juno wrung the pistol from his hand, and said, Now, sir, general, if I were the man you would believe me to be, I might, and most likely would, shoot you. But you cruelly wrong me, as well as your own faithful daughter. Great heaven! could i only find out where she is exclaimed dr juno with great tears in his eyes 
which fairly changed the general's ideas when he asked tell me then where have you been all the time that no one knew of your whereabouts i was kidnapped one thursday evening as i was walking down chestnut street and carried to the insane asylum in west philadelphia and cast into a most dreadful dungeon and only made my escape by a miracle through a faithful servant whose name i vowed not to mention i believe that your daughter is confined in the same asylum said dr juno my god you have opened my senses to an awful suspicion yes sir and the very deacon who stands so high in the church and who is also president of this asylum is in love with your child and very likely he is torturing her inside of those walls but this is only a suspicion i know nothing about it and am sorry i have no chance to find out whether she is there or not but it is only a matter of time responded dr juno sympathetically oh my dear son this will set me crazy for i now believe that i have wronged you altogether i am sure of it and feel convinced that we have all been wronged by the very people in whom i had the utmost confidence but let me invoke you young man to remain steadfast in principle and honour come what may for the day of reckoning will come and god is just and immutably impartial remember that sadly replied the general yes sir you are right and i prefer death to dishonour moreover principle with me is everything i know it i know it but i have greatly wronged you for which i ask ten thousand pardons said the general interrupting dr juno who continued nay do not ask pardon of me because you have only done what any good father would do and had you done less i could not respect and love you as i now do young man you break my poor distressed heart i have suffered a million of deaths since last we have seen each other happy together i mean my beloved daughter and myself lord oh lord comfort an old bereft desolate man's soul in this bitter hour of sorrow but where oh where is my daughter my daughter which were the last sane words that general washington arrington spoke dr juno called his servant and requested him to join him in conducting the old man to his home as he esteemed him in such a feeble state of mind as to be unsafe to let him go unattended when they arrived at the general's residence pat o'connor and judy mccree were thunderstruck to see their master in such a distressed state of mind but they feared danger very much to have dr juno found at their home therefore pat proposed to send for sister nancy clover who was the general's best friend and in whom the general always had wonderful confidence dr juno said nothing but did not wish to meet nancy clover for his heart throbbed when he heard her name mentioned the doctor therefore left the house saying to judy mccree if his services were wanted to send for him she responded yes sir the moment sister nancy clover arrived she said the general is insane and he must at once be taken to the west philadelphia insane asylum Ach, murder almost audibly mumbled pat o'connor and said aloud your lady would not take me good master away from home would ye why not indignantly responded nancy clover he is insane and our asylum for such invalids is the proper place pat and judy withdrew from the presence of the pious sister when pat said judy darlin what do you think over this dunes be st patrick i be dumb struck with this work Ugh, pat and i be sick over this asylum to think pat darling what these peoples may do to me master and mistress when they have them in that devilish place said judy these faithful servants were in great distress to find their master insane who should share the fate of his poor daughter and what would become of the general's property which was a puzzle to them but very likely the bloody clique would become the guardians of the estate and use his money under the pretense that they support him in their asylum thus they will become owners of the bodies souls and property of the arrington family but thought pat o'connor i'll expose the whole thing at the right places and i may awaken my chance to do it it may be necessary to say here that the riot which took place on the sunday evening when dr juno was locked out of concert hall was instigated by the interfering of these bloody conspirators it having been the work of deacon rob stew and the police who were injured could blame no one but these vipers and their co-conspirators 
the Mayor and Young Men's Association. They never tried to arrest or even accuse Dr. Juno for causing this riot, because they knew too well where their bread was buttered. Had Dr. Juno been arrested for causing a breach of the peace, which a former mayor tried his best to bring about on several occasions when Dr. Juno preached in the theatre, it would have turned in favour of the latter, as there were too many fearless witnesses ready to expose the dastardly outrage that was practised by those who claimed to be the city fathers and guardians of the inalienable liberties of men. There are times in the affairs of human events when even the religious bigots, however mighty they are, cannot master everything, and we prophesy that before half a century is gone, these bloody conspirators and false interpreters of the Bible and misrepresentatives of Jesus Christ, God and nature, will be looked upon as the offscoring of the earth and greatest blasphemers of all the heathen ages. End of chapter 27 Recording by Todd Chapter 28 of The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 28. Dr. Juno Arrested in His Pulpit for Selling Obscene Books. Dr. Juno was too wide awake to take to the baits which the bloody conspirators cast before him. He was not a lawbreaker, but rather a law-maker, and he practiced what he preached, which proved a perfect safeguard against such traps as were set for him, and therefore the only possible way to imprison or kill him was to use foul means. Several novel but unsuccessful plans were instituted against him. The conspirators connived with several policemen to shoot him some night, as it were, by accident. The following was the designed manner of making all things safe and sound. Two policemen were to keep an eye on him, and when he would be called out some dark night, they should be pretending to be tracking a thief, and just as he leaves his door, they should fire at him with perfect aim, and shoot him dead in a mistake for a burglar, which would remove Dr. Juno and acquit the policemen, who would be lauded for their vigilance, whilst very few persons would regret the accidental death of Juno. The foregoing was the plot established and actually carried out by Deacon Rob Stew and two policemen. These public guardians of private citizens shot, as stated, five bullets, well aimed, one night at Dr. Juno, as he was called to see a patient. As soon as he left his doorstep, these policemen fired, and continued firing at him, whilst he took to running in the direction of his patient, until five shots exhausted their ammunition, but they failed to touch him. The neighborhood was aroused, and when the report spread, at two o'clock in the night, that a policeman had shot five well-aimed bullets at Dr. Juno, mistaking him for a thief, but utterly failing to hit the doctor, all sorts of sentiments were then and there expressed. His friends denounced these policemen, whilst his enemies abused them for being such poor shots. One officer did all the shooting, and he told Dr. Juno himself afterwards that he took special aim three times, and whilst he could nine times out of ten hit a ten-cent piece at thirty paces, he had been within ten paces of Dr. Juno when he stopped to aim. This was a miraculous escape. The officer said, Doctor, should I have killed you, I would have had no trouble to be acquitted, because I was sure you were a thief who came out of your house. Again Dr. Juno escaped miraculously, and the conspirators became superstitious, because nothing can kill this innovator. He was repeatedly annoyed by those who proffered their advice, but nothing insulted him more than to have any one suggest how he should act or what he had better do. Inducements were next presented to him to leave the city. Even several thousand dollars were offered him if he would leave the place for a year, but all such movements were treated with disdain, and the propounder felt cheaper than ever in his life because Dr. Juno would reply to all such propositions, 
no sir the pharisees of philadelphia require to have one fearless and competent man over them who can expose their heinousness it may be seen from the foregoing history of the antagonistic parties that neither of them were idle nor did grass grow under any of their feet each was determined to conquer or die which was a noble determination for the side which had right to back it the religionists had the lucre position and seven-eighths majority which gave them immense power and influence whilst the single-handed reformer dr juno stood comparatively alone and his only power rested in his oratorical capacity and tact in explaining fixed laws therefore the public rostrum was his power sphere to cause a successful battle with his opponents he consequently searched for another large public hall of central location to preach in and as luck would have it an old german theatre had burned down some months prior which was rebuilt by a jew and at this time this new establishment was just being then inaugurated and dr juno succeeded in leasing it for sunday evening preaching as soon as the bloody conspirators found out that dr juno had rented the magnificent new theatrical hall in callow hill near fifth street they sent a committee of three retired gentlemen to the proprietor of this hall to buy him off they addressed him as follows mr s we have learned that dr juno has leased your magnificent new establishment for sabbath evening preaching yes sir he has said the proprietor do you not suppose that if you permit him to preach in it that it will ruin the reputation of your place no sir i do not sharply replied the proprietor well my dear friend said the chairman of the committee may be you do not know the odium that is attached to this man no sir i do not and i don't care as long as he has paid me my price and so long as he continues to do so i care nothing further what attaches to him or to you who are you anyway indignantly exclaimed the proprietor we are a committee of christians sent by the young men's association to consult you on this matter said the chairman sir i am a jew not a christian hence i spurn your proposals good day ejaculated the proprietor and walked away this ended the interference in that quarter deacon rob stew's course was now resorted to so this committee of retired gentlemen saints called upon the pious and obliging mayor and told his honor that dr juno had engaged the magnificent new hall in callow hill street and had advertised to preach there the following sabbath evening that they had been to see the proprietor to persuade him not to permit juno to speak therein but before they could finish their proposal he told them sharply that he was a jew and that dr juno could have it as long as he paid his price for it that they were just going to offer to pay the said price if he would not let juno have it when he said good day and walked away that the only thing now left for them to do was for the mayor to send forthwith one of his detectives to dr juno's office to buy from him a copy of each of his publications as he published and sold an obscene book and if the mayor would have a warrant issued after having said books and direct his officers to retain that warrant until sabbath evening just before dr juno should commence to preach they should arrest him and lock him up all night in a cell in the central station giving the particulars to the newspapers which would cause a tumultuous hue and cry the following morning which would turn the entire community against the prisoner the holy mayor coincided with this plan and true as preaching he had it carried out to the letter and dr juno was cast into a cold close cell with a horse thief End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers 
by simon landis chapter twenty nine the insane general armington nearly murders the physician-in-chief it will be remembered that when deacon rob stew last visited miss lucinda armington in her prison house he tormented her until she fainted dead away when he was frightened for he really thought he had killed her and although if she were dead he would not need to fear anything except jemmy who might be brought some day from his cell to testify in a court of justice because politics change men and in sooth men themselves are changeable therefore he shuddered at the idea of having caused miss lucinda armington's death the deacon at once went to the physician-in-chief of the asylum and told him that he had just visited miss armington and he believed that she was dead although the physician-in-chief was in rapport with the bloody conspirators and was in fact a member of the bloody clique he did not know that the pious deacon had ever loved the girl that he had been jilted by her or that he tortured the poor creature whilst he made his frequent visits to her cell the physician-in-chief rather thought that the generous deacon was kindly inclined toward miss armington hence he did not dream of anything occurring through his deacon's visits that was disagreeable to the young lady whom the physician-in-chief was inclined to love respect and treat with more than ordinary kindness because she was the daughter of his old friend and schoolmate general washington armington who was now really insane on account of this very daughter of his the physician-in-chief instantly went to her cell asking the deacon to accompany him but he excused himself fearing she might not be dead and might cause an unpleasant onslaught on his deaconship and when the doctor entered her cell she was seated on her chair looking somewhat stupefied but seeming rational and talkative miss armington at once asked him doctor why am i confined in this place and why do you permit deacon rob stew to enter my prison house to insult and torture me my dear miss armington i hope the deacon does not treat you rudely is it not your imagination only that he treats you badly said the physician-in-chief no sir i imagine nothing but know of what i speak he has insulted me awfully and one time he came to me in disguise and after making this cell dark offered the grossest indignities until he so enraged me that i beat him furiously which may have seemed insane in me but being in an insane asylum it must be excusable because i might as well have the game as the name this place is enough to make one crazy but you will please inform me why i am incarcerated here exclaimed miss armington my poor girl your father ordered you to be placed here for your own good fearing you would be led astray by that dr victor juno who really is out of his natural senses or he would not set himself against all the usages of society he pitches into everything and everybody and that shows that he is a lunatic who ought to be confined in prison or an insane institution like this he will sooner or later come to grief because you cannot find anybody who approves of his course of action said the doctor sir you wrong him he is a scientific man and sincere christian with a most benevolent heart and you said that no one approves of his course of action let me disabuse your mind on that question i heartily approve of all he does and if some of the bigots who claim more nicety than they possess wisdom would attend to their own business and let him alone he would make many sound bodies and expansive minds who would become members of the christian church yes sir he is in the right and his persecutors know it and the people whom the pharisees dread also know it the latter would gladly receive the natural teachings of dr juno but there are so many ignorant bigoted and self-righteous sinners in this world who are envious selfish and jealous of a man who is so far their superior that they would murder him for being what he cannot help to be namely a genuine benefactor and natural christian responded miss armington greatly relieved you are quite a trumpeter for this dr juno rather sarcastically said the doctor i only speak the holy truth which some of you cannot appreciate 
nor dare you maintain it like my noble victor haughtily she exclaimed indeed i think your actions prove you to be as insane as he and your own father evidently saw that hence placed you in this asylum said he monster do you say that my father had anything to do with this foul act never never but i fear that my poor old father and probably my dear victor are even now both incarcerated not far from here you start you know it then to be a fact oh fiend you also belong to those bloody conspirators she said in agony miss armington you insult me and i now see why the deacon has been pronounced cruel and insulting by you you first insulted him as you do me responded the doctor am i not your prisoner your slave let me have my freedom and you may offer me any insult you choose and i will not retaliate but to be thus innocently confined in a madhouse whose inner walls are polluted by men of seared minds and blackened hearts is more than mortal can bear without expressing the scorn and loathing that prompts the tongue of its victim to speed ejaculated miss armington you then are of the opinion that we try to abuse and insult you which certainly is not the case as for deacon rob stew i cannot speak but i assure you that with my consent neither he nor any one else shall abuse or insult you and i would like you to feel more pleasantly toward me than you have expressed in your remarks said the doctor i will think over the matter she said in a mood that was indicative of deep thought the physician-in-chief bade her good day and left the unhappy prisoner thinking about deacon rob stew what could he mean by abusing the dear beautiful girl why should he visit her in disguise and darken the cell i am suspicious and shall keep my eye on his saintship after all these pious deacons have their failings and passions like other men but he shall not insult her any more she is beautiful and if i were not a married man i should be tempted myself to make love to her and undoubtedly this is what the deacon did when she refused his overtures and spoke lovingly of dr juno confound it i love the darling little minx myself married or not and it is a great temptation to have her thus in one's power at any rate i shall not allow the old deacon to insult her any more i shall visit her soon again the physician-in-chief called on general washington armington to ascertain if he was comfortable in his apartment and learn also if he had any symptoms of sanity he found the general perfectly crazy talking continually about his abducted daughter and fairly raved over the outrage of slandering victor juno he said yes these devils wear the livery of heaven to serve the devil they have abducted dr juno and my beloved daughter and now they ravish them both in their dungeons heaven above me protect them save them away you murdering hypocrites you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for you neither go in nor permit others to enter therein i see the beginning of your heinous end and won't i laugh at your calamity when the tables have turned ha 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 just then the crazy general took notice for the first time that someone was with him when he cried out ha you are one of them and sprang upon the doctor like an infuriated fiend End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter thirty harry gossamer condemned to death the bloody conspirators found brother harry gossamer guilty of internal rebellion perjury and threatened exposure they therefore sentenced him to death whilst the prisoner was confined in the dungeon unlike open courts they convened a court-martial and in his absence tried him without any defence 
because he as good as pleaded guilty to all the charges by his bold words to the brotherhood and the principal speech that was made deacon rob stew delivered he said brothers and sisters of the sacredly secret conclave i am grieved at heart as you may well know that i am compelled to call upon you to pronounce a unanimous verdict against our apostate brother harry gossamer who had the reckless audacity to defy us and threatened to leave the brotherhood after he voluntarily took our solemn oath and i consider it a most dangerous thing to permit any member to faint and flag after he or she has remained at our special meetings and has listened to all our holy work i therefore propose to act quickly and without prevarication convict sentence and execute the sentence forthwith of harry gossamer for the wavering disposition he has exhibited a few minutes since before us all if we do not act summarily in such cases we shall ere long find the rope around our own necks i do not fancy that interrupted rev joe peer and therefore i hope to see this case instantly and permanently disposed of because i shake in my boots when i think of the responsible work of piety we are compelled to perform i say continued the deacon that our only salvation individually and collectively mark you lies in visiting the penalty of death upon each and every one who falters in the performance of duty instead of brother gossamer standing up in our sacred hall and saying i am not willing to cooperate with you in the fulfilment of this nefarious work he ought to have encouraged the brotherhood to go on and if he did not wish to act in his capacity of an active member should not have joined us he is a chicken-hearted scoundrel or a faithless and unprincipled dog who shall not be allowed to bark and bite us if i know what i am about brethren our holy cause demands especially at this auspicious moment most vigorous unanimous action because we have our hands full look for instance there is dr juno preaching publicly and privately in his own hall and he shortly hopes to address immense crowds again down in the centre of the city again there is miss armington who is as rebellious as the devil could make her and although she is incarcerated where she cannot harm us now yet i fear unless vigorous action is had in her case she may do a deal of injury sooner or later to our sainthood moreover all the pious denominations and worldlings must be watched and kept blindfolded which when we cast only a cursory glance at the immense work before us we may see the necessity of being a unit inside of our secret conclave brothers are you therefore ready to cast a unanimous vote in favor of dispatching harry gossamer this very night before we adjourn i rise to ask our loyal and energetic deacon a question if he will permit me to do so said dr toy pansy certainly brother pansy go on responded the deacon do you think dear brother that it would be wise to execute brother gossamer who evidently thought that as long as we were all sworn to perfect secrecy he could speak out his heartfelt sentiments i know the brother thoroughly he is an exemplary man noble liberal and energetic i wish to ask the brotherhood with the permission of our worthy deacon whether it would not be better to be lenient and permit brother gossamer to make a defence at least let him make a speech before this court-martial i object to it interrupted deacon rob stew for if we are to be as lenient and slow to act as brother toy pansy proposes we might as well already consider our saintly work stopped and run the risk of being mobbed by the advocates and followers of dr juno i say brothers and sisters we cannot entertain such propositions and i now call for the unanimous vote of a conclave to a verdict of death in the case of the defendant said the deacon terribly agitated and ready for a fight to the hilt with any one who would dissent from his views the physician-in-chief of the insane asylum now rose to the floor and asked permission to say a few words he said mr president and holy saints i claim to be a faithful laborer in the common cause which we espouse but as a christian 
i cannot join in a work that sends a man who may differ from me so summarily into the presence of his maker brother stew is an enthusiast and although a noble and zealous worker who has more influence than any dozen of our best men combined we should remember that he can err as well as other men and therefore he should take the sound counsel of some of us as old and faithful to our cause as he silence ejaculated the deacon you are an old drone you are not now dealing with a lot of lunatics who are compelled to obey your mandates or even regard your charitable advice if our lenient doctor-in-chief will point out one act of mine that was uncharitable toward any one of our cause or that what i did proved an injury to any good member of the faith whether in active service in the secret conclave or not i will yield to him i'll take you at your word exclaimed the physician-in-chief have you not acted in an uncharitable manner toward our misled yet faithful sister lucinda armington not a year since in our asylum moreover a word to the wise will suffice curse your trifling and may the marrow in your stereotyped bones rot for intruding into private workings of this conclave what under the sun has the business of the insane asylum to do with this apostate mr president i emphatically say in a mood that means work or death mr president i command you to order all dissenting harangues as being irrelevant to the subject in consideration i demand this under the penalty of our solemn oath and i add if your beating heart is not to be torn out by its roots forthwith you will heed my admonition and act determinedly i say speak y yes i agree with brother stew and and rule that all that has been said by those who differ with our worthy deacon is irrelevant to the subject under consideration and this i order under the penalty of having the beating heart of each disputant torn out by its roots so help us god stammeringly responded rev joe peer nancy clover now jumped to the floor as if she meant mischief and said brothers i have listened patiently and i see that unless you have a determined principle to be governed by you won't agree to advantage now i am not a woman of words nor do i stand with folded hands to see those who ought to have one object in view namely the subjugation of innovators and advancement of the cause of the elect quarrel bicker and bite each other without trying to stop them in their mad career is not our cause just is its prosperity not a mutual benefit why then fight over trifles like schoolboys i say do as brother rob stew says even if it goes against your beautiful tender feelings else you may be compelled to take what will be ten thousand times worse do you understand me act in unison and dispatch this apostate who undoubtedly would betray us especially since you have beaten and thrown him into our nasty dungeon sister clover's neat little speech made the members a unit and immediately harry gossamer was condemned to die End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Social War of 1900 or the Conspirators and Lovers by Simon Landis. Chapter 31. Harry Gossamer's Heroic and Thrilling Speech Before They Drown Him. The President, Reverend Joe Pyre, ordered the Sentinel to bring the prisoner, Harry Gossamer, before him that he may receive his sentence which was death however with his choice of hanging or drowning the president then addressed him as follows harry gossamer the brothers and sisters have convened themselves into a court-martial and have found you guilty of violating the solemn oath of our secret conclave and you must know that the penalty is death but the court unanimously agreed that you should not be treated to the full punishment as avowed in our solemn oath but that you may choose between hanging and drowning 
this favour was granted you because you have not done any mischief as yet otherwise you would have had your left hand burned into cinders your right hand cut into fragments and your beating heart torn out by its roots i am sorrowful and heavily grieved at this terrible state of affairs but there is no appeal from this tribunal therefore if you have anything to say now is your time the distressed and horror-stricken harry gossamer rose to his feet and said in a tremulous voice i suppose i have deserved some punishment but this i did not expect nor do i merit it still as there can be no appeal from this august and holy tribunal i hope god will pardon you for this dastardly crime i hope i am not intruding nor violating any more sacred pledges so that your noble deacon might have this humane sentence revoked and recommit me for trial and then give me the full blast of the terrible and accursed oath that i was compelled to take go on noble apostate interrupted the deacon we care little what you say to us as long as you die before you can divulge any of our secret plans may i then say what i choose without having my verdict changed asked the convict yes sir responded the reverend joe pyre hear me then said the prisoner i've always despised hypocrites and pharisees and believed that they were the most blasphemous wretches living thus agreeing with jesus christ but i did not think that such a bloody villainous accursed set of vipers could breathe the breath of life who were one tithe as wicked as the elated deacon rob stew sister nancy clover and the dastardly reverend joe pyre a trinity that outvies the blackest imps of the infernal regions when such perfidious monsters can rule a nation then is doomsday near at hand and i can die happy when i reflect upon the heinous crime i have committed when i became a member of this sacredly secret conclave so sacred as to prefer to murder an innocent person in cold blood then that a noble hero like dr victor juno should be permitted to succeed in the amelioration and elevation of the human race which could not harm any one except those who are a scab upon society and a pestiferous stench in the presence of god and man if you or your likes go to heaven i want to go to hell because the very sight of such loathsome vermin would destroy my happiness and turn the realms of the blessed into regions of despair you all have my keenest contempt and i am now ready to be sentenced to be drowned at once or later if it suits your despicable natures better farewell until we meet again for we shall at a future hour see the glory of god by observing retribution visiting your worthless souls preparations were now being made to drown the apostate in the depth of the sea he was gagged securely and tightly bound by cords so that it was utterly impossible to be relieved then he was put into a large salt sack in the bottom of which iron weights were placed and this done he was nailed up in a dry goods box and instantly carried to the delaware river in deacon rob stew's charity wagon which everybody almost knew and when the same reached the wharf the box was at once placed upon a speedy little schooner and carried to the ocean where the box was quickly opened and the salt sack with its iron and human weight dropped quietly overboard which sank like lead thus was the sentence executed and the sharks or worms of the briny deep would feast their carnivorous natures upon the carcass of harry gossamer the apostate the schooner immediately set sail for its own harbor and the faithful sentinel rejoiced with six brethren and one sister of the sacredly sacred conclave but they did not dream that a wakeful irishman was watching the proceedings regularly at tabernacle hall 
and when the deacon's charity wagon was being driven toward the wharf pat o'connor smelled a mouse he therefore ran in the rear of the wagon and when he saw them remove the box to the schooner he at once went to a friend who lived in a shanty about ten squares down the delaware wharf who made his living by boating and as good luck would have it the boatman was just about anchoring his fastest rowboat pat o'connor said to him patrick kin i git ye to hire me your best and fastest rowboat what one man kin row yes sir why pat o'connor is that you responded the boatman on to be sure it be myself a wantin to do a leetle night work for myself said pat he forthwith jumped into the rowboat and sure as fate there just a little ahead of him sailed a well-known pious vessel making good speed toward the sea well mumbled pat o'connor to himself as he pulled his oars with ease i'll be out of your bloody curmudgeon and see what ye are doing on the river this time o night pat o'connor had no trouble to row as fast as the schooner sailed and as the night was rather dark there was no danger of him being seen after they had gone beyond the reach of the city lights he therefore crept near to the schooner watching it closely for fear it might stop suddenly when he might be detected the ocean was tame and therefore all things favored pat when the schooner had passed about a quarter of a mile from the mouth of the river it stopped so did pat o'connor's boat and after turning something overboard the schooner sailed off and making a circle steered homeward but pat did not sail off nor steer homeward just then but he went as near to the spot as he could where the salt sack filled with iron and flesh was thrown into the ocean and as fate would have it harry gossamer got one of his hands at liberty before they reached the wharf and he managed with it to get his knife out of his pocket however he was so tightly packed into the box that he could not open the blade until he was removed from the same when thus liberated he instantly opened the knife with his teeth of the lower jaw and by the time he sank a few feet he had his rope and salt sack cut to pieces which gave him the use of his two hands whilst his feet were bound until pat o'connor reached forth and drew him into his rowboat end of chapter thirty one recording by john brandon chapter thirty two of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by lisa reichert the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter thirty two dr juno convicted imprisoned and attempts made to poison him dr victor juno was compelled to spend that sunday night in the filthy cold cell with the horse thief where he took an awful cold but at nine o'clock monday morning he was brought before the presiding magistrate although he waived a hearing and entered bail in two thousand dollars to appear at the court of sessions in six days he was arraigned and tried before the pious judge sanctiblower who conspired with the sanctimonious district attorney charlson to rule out all the evidence that dr juno might produce the district attorney argued that all the evidence that could be relevant was for the commonwealth to prove that this book on the physiology of marriage had been bought from dr juno and the book itself was to be given to the jury which was composed of picked ringleaders from the saintly crowd and the jurymen alone unaided by experts or law or anything else should decide if it were an obscene book or not dr juno had twenty experts in court eight of these twenty eminent physicians were professors of medical colleges he also had over two hundred additional witnesses in court by the former he wished to prove the scientific correctness of the book and show by the latter that the book had benefited them in various ways but the district attorney objected to hearing any of dr juno's witnesses except the purity of character which was proved beyond a doubt and the august judge sanctiblower ruled to suit the district attorney 
the counsel for the defence produced the following law points but his honour dodged them all and gave instead his own opinion viz if the jury believe the defendant have in view the benefit of society however wrong the ideas or objectionable the language there is no malice and he should be acquitted again if the design of the book was to benefit society it does not show malice to take measures to extend its circulation again if the production was honestly meant to inform the public mind and warn them against supposed dangers in society though the subject may have been treated erroneously then however the judgment of the jury may incline them to think individually they should acquit the defendant if the jury doubt of the criminal intention then also the law pronounces that he should be acquitted the few witnesses who were permitted to testify to the excellent character of dr juno shrewdly worked in that the book in question had benefited them very much and when such evidence slipped in before it could be stopped by the district attorney the old pious judge sanctiblower would yell out that is purely a question for the jury to decide the counsel for dr juno then quoted the following law points in a criminal prosecution for the libel the defendant may repel the charge by providing that the publication was for a justifiable purpose and not malicious nor with the intention to defame any man and there may be many cases where the defendant having proved the purpose justifiable may give in evidence the truth of the words when such evidence will tend to negative the malice and intent to defame commonwealth versus clap four mass one sixty three again the supreme court of the united states decided that whenever the author or publisher of the alleged slander acted in the bona fide discharge of a public or private duty legal or moral such communication is privileged white and nichols three howard two sixty seven again as the offence of publishing a libel consists of the malicious publication of it which as already stated is in general inferred from the words of the alleged libel itself it is competent to the defendant in all cases to show the absence of malice on his part roscoe's criminal evidence five twenty eight to all this and much more equally strong law points judge sanctiblower paid no attention at all because he told the young men's association previously to bring dr juno into the court of sessions and he would fix him the jury obeyed the judge and district attorney and of course convicted dr juno in spite of law evidence and their oaths to decide according to law and evidence the judge then sentenced him to the full extent of the law for publishing an obscene libel which was one year in the county prison and five hundred dollars fine he was at once closely confined in a felon's cell but the governor of the commonwealth was a man of honour and when a friend of dr juno called upon his excellency with a copy of the book on the physiology of marriage and also a copy of the fully printed trial the governor at once pardoned and even exonerated dr juno which set him free after having served four months of his time whilst dr juno was incarcerated the newspaper oracle of the bloody conspirators libelled him awfully also the minor daily newspapers howled dreadfully seeing a chance now to gain some note at the expense of dr juno they called him everything but decent names had he been a sot Rue, brawler glutton miser gambler liar politician hypocrite pharisee viper or cutthroat he would have been a decent man compared with the character the public press of philadelphia gave this martyred man and when governor golden pardoned him the holy saints and newspaper scribes were overawed horrified and amazed for they believed that there was no power on earth that could induce the governor to pardon him the bloody clique went repeatedly to the executive and requested him not to pardon dr juno for the life of him he himself told the person to whom he gave said pardon that the prejudice against dr juno was immense which he could not understand and the governor said if there was not so much prejudice against the man i would not pardon him 
for prejudice is the child of envy and not of crime dr juno was not in prison a week until the bloody clique sent their friends who belonged to the prison society to visit him in his cell and they appeared very kind giving him apples figs cakes etc the doctor did not trust these nice people he therefore placed these articles aside for inspection and upon examination he discovered arsenic piled snugly inside a lot of the figs but the person who prepared them was not an expert or instead of having inserted the raw powdered arsenic into the figs he would have steeped them in a solution of the poison they again failed to murder him and as soon as he told the prison keepers and inspectors that an attempt was made to poison him they got very indignant and locked him up as tight as wax and treated him awfully mean which proved that at least some of them belonged to the bloody clique dr juno soliloquized as follows i cannot see why these people should be so determined to murder me i have never done anything that would injure or demoralize them or their children if i had kept a body house rum shop gambling room low concert saloon political swindling house or followed the thousand and one injurious criminal and fashionable pursuits extant i would have been esteemed as a good fellow but as i have opposed all these and other unhealthy and unphysiological customs and have proved by the religion that jesus christ established that my course was scientific and right they have given me a mock trial in open court and in the face of a republican country have cast me into this prison for serving god nature and mankind god forgive these degraded wicked wretches for really they know not what they are doing when dr juno was pardoned he at once returned to his old work of lecturing preaching and practising his profession and to his astonishment he did more business and had more intelligent audiences than he ever had before this was a consolation to him but a terrible disappointment to the saintly crowd who now instituted more and worse plans of operation and whilst dr juno pursued the even tenor of his course as if nothing had ever happened to him the conspirators in one combined effort appealed to the state legislature to pass a law which would suppress religious liberty and which movement broke their camel's back end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by meg turasek the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter thirty three dr juno's first sharpshooting sermon on ministers and doctors note if the reader wants to fully understand the plot of this story he must carefully peruse every discourse by dr juno or when he arrives at the most interesting part of it he cannot comprehend what made him the hero of our story the following discourse was delivered in his own hall to a crowded house immediately after his pardon this is not fiction s m l beloved friends we live in a progressive age everything around us moves and appears to keep pace with time except the doctrines of our own bodily and spiritual functions the true laws of life or laws of soul life and soul meaning the same thing for he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils and he became a living soul have not yet been reduced to a popular practical and scientific standpoint truly the platform upon which mankind stands at present in relation to human health and perfection of body and soul is as far from being on an equality with the material arts and sciences as satan is from attaining celestial glory or 
as the honorable judge sanctiblower is from a follower of decent judgment thousands nay millions have speculated and theorized over these dogmas for more than three thousand years and they are apparently no wiser or better now indeed if as wise and good as they were when they commenced ministers and doctors have been on a wild goose chase for fully seventeen hundred and fifty years having perverted the simple though scientific teachings and practices of jesus christ who healed both bodily and spiritual ills and that without drug medicines these teachings harmonized with the true physiology or in other words the scientific doctrines of the laws of life before medicines were introduced as healing agencies the cure of human ills was entrusted to the power of the inherent recuperative vital spark or inner man and the high priests by recommending fasting and prayer holy faith cleanliness ventilation bathing quietude exercise including the use of symbols charms beads etc to pacify the mind restored the sick with wonderful success as compared and contrasted with the methods of cure which are now so fashionable but destructive to body soul and comfort by our numerous blind leaders of blind who lead the millions into the broad road to hell very few were the wants and fewer the diseases that existed before medicines were introduced but as soon as paracelsus and others introduced mercury and a host of other medicinal nostrums so soon did diseases increase in number and the vital principle of life became vitiated also the imaginary wants of the race multiplied and it seems ever since man has lived by art instead of nature has doctored by art and he is trying to fly to heavenly glory on golden wings it is to the sorrow and fate of our bodily constitutions that medicinal poisons that are non-usable by a natural healthy organism have been swallowed ever since in this delusive hope that the healing power lies in the material agency instead of the inner man or nature no wonder that the most eminent lights of the medical world have denounced the whole materia medica and the concomitant practices of their profession the celebrated dr rush said as long as medicinal agencies increase in number so long will diseases multiply sir astley cooper said speaking of the medical profession as a whole it is founded on conjecture and improved by murder dr frank said thousands are slaughtered in a quiet sick room long established customs seem to make law and hence the popular belief that medicines are really needed to assist nature in curing the ills flesh is heir to instead of being always poisonous totally incompatible to and non-usable by nature although they may excite the inner life or nature as a whip stimulates a horse but to say that either the medicine or whip aids the life of man or horse is absurd at the best medicines only thwart the recuperative process of nature galvanize or pickle the tissues patch up the breach of the law of life or at once burn out the vital spark beloved friends having shown you plainly the error into which drug doctors have fallen i will now open your eyes to the blasphemies and anti-natural doctrines of the sectarian ministers who advocate praying for everything they want instead of learning and living out the fixed laws of god and thereby letting their light shine in good works by returning to truth and nature and scientifically saving themselves and their children from the sins diseases and crimes that abound everywhere notwithstanding there are much speaking blind faith and long sanctimonious prayers jesus christ says of such 
they that think that they shall be heard for their much speaking and on numerous occasions commands us all not to pray as the hypocrites do for they love to pray in the synagogues that they may be seen of men etc we have therefore two kinds of institutions that are antichrist and antinatural which causes also two kinds of poverty both of which need immediate attention if the human race is to be benefited elevated and christianized but i am sorry to be compelled to state that from the acts of doctors and preachers it appears the human species can continue to degenerate without any scientific voice crying aloud improve the blood of your species as the farmer improves his stock of cattle for the fixed laws of generation and regeneration are at hand and the spirit of the immaculate son of man knocketh at the door of the heart but its hinges are rusted therefore it cannot open to let in the monitor of grace and power divine hence we have first poverty in health of body and soul which is produced by ignorant willful or accidental violation of the fixed laws of life and secondly comes poverty in purse over which millions are made to moan and groan which is caused by unphysiological domestic habits such as expensive cookery mixing and mincing messes of animal food vegetables spices relishes condiments sugar in overdoses teas coffees and a host of other drugs too numerous to mention thereby producing more appetite than health would furnish hence eating and drinking thrice as much as nature requires truly each social gathering religious or secular must wind up with a feast and at every corner of the street in our boasted civilized and christianized cities we find several grog shops and as many eating houses and each being filled with the most vicious qualities of ailment plainly showing that saint and sinner look upon the stomach as a receptacle to hold all sorts of hash trash poison and swill few of our clergy as well as saint and sinner miss laying in a good supply as often as an opportunity affords not because the body or soul needs it but to tickle a depraved appetite to get a little pleasure from swallowing thus they swallow the devil evil by piecemeal but withal claim a saintly name moreover the ladies have their dining-room cupboards well loaded with game rich cake and sundry other unhealthy dainties unfitted for the stomach of a hotentote and the poor stomach is made a laboratory for everything that is palatable to the gustatory propensities the consequence is depraved digestion which according to popular christianity and fashionable customs must be aided by wines tobacco spiritous liquors medicines lager ale and schnapps immediately following these unchristlike and unnatural domestic habits we find sickness ugliness peevishness irritability scrawniness flabby muscles morbid longings perverted judgments false ambitions spurious modesty malice debility disease bloodless cheeks etc which are in a measure remedied by expensive dress paddings laces braces paints powders rouges perfumes to overcome bad odors and the like to imitate nature but alas what is this make-up as compared with pristine beauty symmetrical contour of muscle rounded form elastic step the natural healthful rose-leaf blooming on the cheek coral lip and the soul enchanting eye with natural acute senses and a sound mind in a sound body these are settled truths may i ask with saint paul am i therefore become your energy because i tell you the truth good friends for uttering publishing 
and advocating such truths, I have been sent to prison, cast into a felon's cell, to appease the appetites of scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And will you stand by and allow these vipers and bloody conspirators in this age of science to persecute a man who, knowing the truth, dare maintain it? in spite of ministers and doctors who neither comprehend nor care to learn or live out the fixed laws of god but who do their best to inveigle you into their highness sophistries and perfidious practices arise or be forever lost end of chapter thirty three Chapter 34 of The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 34 Pat O'Connor saves Harry Gossamer from drowning, but are both arrested. When Harry Gossamer, the apostate conspirator, who was sentenced to be drowned, was being hauled by Pat O'Connor into the latter's boat, Pat said, Be me soul, but ye are a square fish. Who air ye? I am the victim of a most foul plot, but who are you, that you have arrived at such an opportune moment, like an angel dropped from heaven, especially to save my miserable life, responded Harry Gossamer. Ejabers, I'm neither an angel dropped from heaven, nor an idle speculator. No, sir, you are a Christian, interrupted Harry Gossamer, for coming to my rescue, for which you have my never-failing thanks. Please, don't blarney me with your smooth tongue. Neither do you owe me any thanks, sir, because I was a fishin' for a bait what I may use some day for to catch a few cunning great fish with, said Pat, laughing. You are merry, but tell me, do you know how I came here at this time of night? replied Harry Gossamer. No, responded Pat. But, Dad, and I think I ought to know, when I watched them squally curmudgeons this many a day. Watched them many a day, said Harry Gossamer. What do you mean by them? Ach, howly murderer, don't you think I knows them bloody conspirators? And do you think I does not owe them a grudge spitefully exclaimed pat i see that you have evidently been injured by these people who brought me here bound sacked and boxed to drown me and who now think i am dead and food for fishes said harry gossamer ach they dirty divils but what mane ye by saying that ye were bound sacked and boxed asked Pat O'Connor. Well, please let me tell you, they sentenced me to be hanged or drowned. I was permitted the consoling privilege to choose which death I preferred, when I chose drowning, for I thought maybe I might be saved. Bejammers, and your maybe has come true, laughingly interrupted Pat. Yes, ten thousand thanks for your noble self continued harry gossamer and after i had decided to prefer drowning they bound me hand and foot and also gagged me with a strong rope then they put me into a large salt sack and after that they boxed me up in a dry goods box nailing it tightly shut and brought me here in that manner to drown me i suppose you know the means by which they conveyed me here for i don't and sure i knows all about how they brought ye here but be me soul i cannot know how ye comed out of being 
bound, sacked, and boxed. Ye air not a god that ye could tear all them things away from your body. How then did ye get loose? asked Pat. Yes, truly, my dear sir, it would seem curious to be capacitated to extricate oneself from being bound, sacked, and boxed. But when they came to this spot where they sent me overboard, they first took me out of the dry goods box and dropped me in the sack, which had heavy weights in the bottom. But by good luck I got my hand loose, and, when I was removed from the box, I opened my pocket knife with my teeth. And the moment they threw me into the water, I commenced to cut the sack and ropes to pieces, and lastly I cut the gag from my mouth. But you will see that my feet are bound yet, responded the poor victim. Howly Moses, ejaculated Pat, and so they air. But Begora, ye made a narrow escape. You are right, but thank you and the Lord for this deliverance. And now, as I am safe, what had we better do? For these bloody conspirators are dreadful people who would go to any trouble to kill me, responded Harry Gossamer. May I be so bold as to ax ye for what they were a killin' ye? asked Pat. Certainly, with pleasure. I was fool enough to join what they call the sacredly secret conclave and whilst they were congregated in Tabernacle Hall this very night, for the purpose of contriving the most hellish work, I objected to cooperate with them, when they sentenced me to death for violating their ironclad oath, said Harry Gossamer. Thanks for a tellin' me all about it, and I now understand, and I was a thinkin' what we better be a doin' for ye knows them bloody varmint so well as I could tell ye. But, sir, I cannot understand how you know anything about them, for you are an Irishman, and very likely a Roman Catholic, and therefore cannot be, or ever have been, a member of the bloody clique, interrupted Harry Gossamer. And sure, I be an Irish Catholic, and never belonged to them divils, but have I not been a servant with General Washington Armington, and has not Dr. Victor Juno and Miss Lucinda Armington been abducted and throwed into them insane asylum dungeons by them murdering curmudgeon, and haven't I and my Judy darlin' seen enough to know what divils them varmint air? "'Excitedly and angrily said Pat O'Connor. "'I see, I see. "'You know more than I thought any mortal knew outside of their clique. "'But, my dear good saviour, "'do these people know that you are so well posted on these topics?' "'asked Harry Gossamer. "'No, be St. Patrick, they do not, "'and I never mean they shall know.' "'until I be ready for em, ejaculated Pat O'Connor. "'But you speak of this so freely to me, a stranger. "'Are you not afraid that I might inform them of your knowledge, "'and that by so doing they would murder you?' "'Yes, as they did ye,' yeah, interposed Pat, laughing and continued. "'Bejabbers, do you take me for a stupid blackguard?' "'Because do I not know that ye dare not let them know that ye bees alive? "'How the devil could ye tell on me, if ye would?' "'You are truly a philosopher, and anything but a fool, "'and as you have saved my life, I will trust it to you. "'Therefore, where had I better go?' responded Harry Gossamer. "'I have thought of a plan.' You go with me to General Armington's house. I am afraid of being detected there. Will you please give me your name? interrupted Harry Gossamer. Yes, sir. My name be Pat O'Connor, and Judy McCrae 
is me faithful. Now what air ye laughing at? said Pat sheepishly. I was only smiling when you could not say what Judy McCrae was to you, but I know she is your faithful darling, responded Gossamer. And surely you have struck the nail on the head that time, and no one am at the house but she and myself, and she bees as wide awake as myself, and you could trust your life a thousand times with Judy Darlin, earnestly said Pat. They now rode toward home, but it was getting daylight, therefore they had to spend their time along the banks of the Delaware until the following night. They landed at an obscure grove, and cautiously made their way to a hut, and got some refreshments. When they returned to the boat, and sitting talking over the matters with which the reader is already familiar, the day passed hurriedly along, and, when right dark, they pushed up to the boatman's wharf, and just as they landed, Pat O'Connor was patted on the shoulder by an officer who said, "'I believe you are Pat O'Connor?' "'Yes, sir,' responded Pat. "'I have a warrant for you,' said the officer, and continued, "'Who is this with you? I'll arrest him also.' End of chapter 34「Chapter Thirty Five of the Social War of Nineteen Hundred, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek The Social War of Nineteen Hundred, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis Chapter Thirty Five Dr. Juno's Second Startling Sermon on Doctors and Ministers Beloved friends, in my last discourse on doctors of physic and ministers of sectarian Christianity, I have, as briefly and logically as possible, laid open to public gaze the follies and fallacies that are taught and practiced by these misled ink-suckers. Pardon the common parlance that I am often compelled to use in chastising the haughty vipers who sit in Moses's seat. Heaven forbid that the people, who are the bone and sinew of the land, should any longer be kept in ignorance of the fixed laws of their own beings, should be made believe in false prophets, false Christs, and false leaders, that thereby they can be made the easier dupes for those who possess more money than brains, or craft than wisdom. Jesus Christ lived a natural, normal life, and all his precepts and examples were in strict conformity with the fixed laws of life. But where do either the medical doctors or sectarian ministers follow the teachings and example of Jesus? Again, every one has duties resting upon him, which he cannot dodge without a train of the most deplorable evils following close upon his heels, and no one can mend a broken law by swallowing poisons, or by vain repetitions and long prayers, for such conditions he must do penance and return to truth and nature, if he wishes to be crowned with the laurels of pristine beauty, health, and salvation. Two wrongs never can make a right. Departure from nature's law is one wrong, whose penalty generally is sickness, and to take medicines is another wrong, because all medicines are poisonous to a healthy person, therefore cannot make right what departure from nature's fixed law has made wrong. Neither did Jesus ever attempt to heal the sick by poisoning the springs of life, nor by long dictatorial prayers, but he did it by the sick being willing to make themselves passive or penitent, trusting to the God-principle within, 
which he was then capacitated and willing to magnify by animal magnetic and soul arousing powers thus he healed the sick cleansed the lepers raised the dead cast out devils and as freely as he received this power so freely he gave it to all who were willing to do penance and believe in him who was the representative of the fixed laws of life both of body and soul if we go back to the origin of life and take a meagre view at the popular customs of raising and educating children we shall find a wonderful amount of barbarity and atheism practiced even at this progressive and boasted scientific age stuffed with unhealthy food and drink and dosed with physic as our infants are is an outrage that cries aloud to heaven for reformation and enlightenment on this topic am i therefore become your enemy because i tell you the truth saint paul to the galatians if sixteen when the babe grows to childhood he is forced to attend your badly managed schoolrooms where foul air and taxations of brain predominate over good sense and thus the child's constitution is blasted before his bones are one-fourth matured before the framework is half completed and before the soul has established even the outline of a character or molded the faculty of thought the precious casket is shattered and shriveled unfitting it for the indwelling of the holy spirit the youngster at once in school must study letters and figures which when concocted together teach him of brooks rivers lands islands seas sun moon and stars of arts and sciences of wars seats and rumors of war of capitals states cities and empires of valleys hills and mountains of mathematical problems and indeed of everything else except the rules laws and injunctions which concern his own bodily growth and mental development the latter are looked upon by our artificial and ungodly doctors and ministers as improper studies yea even as vulgar and obscene objects which these overlearned professors hold as irrelevant to the enthronement of the image of god or salvation of mankind therefore such matters as the science of life and functions of generation and regeneration must not be discussed or taught either by man or the holy spirit which shows that they prefer the people to go blind through the world probably that the latter may be more readily gulled and led by their noses by these blind leaders of the blind if what i have just spoken be not true why then do these bigots conspire to imprison and murder your humble servant they may endeavor to impress the popular mind time and again that god takes care of the body if its mind is only prayerful and watching him so that he makes no blunders but the propounders of this impious onslaught upon an infinite and beneficent creator shall not go unchastised as long as i have breath to gainsay these infidel and heretical doctrines i tell you dear friends that god never takes care of anything wherein his plans and immutable laws are frustrated and violated in these matters like in the material sciences lip service will not answer but religion must become a science in which we pray with wise heads loving hearts clean hands and supple feet if aught is to be accomplished if through ignorance recklessness or hypocrisy in the onset of life the growth replenishment and physiological recuperation of the human frame are thwart sound good and holy 
it is thus no wonder that with all the church wealth and multitudinous doctors and preachers this world is so full of loafers drunkards politicians sectarian bigots vagabonds and cutthroats am i therefore become your enemy because i tell you the truth truly this people run away from natural laws and commence to depend upon art and human government before they get their eye-teeth cut and no sooner do they depend upon art than nature deserts them and leaves them to rely altogether upon art and this is the reason that they suffer from early old age premature death and from all the ills flesh is heir to moreover they become homely miserable and degraded under these perverted trainings they too often blame their maker for the manifold sufferings which they are compelled to endure and which they would escape were they to take an equal amount of interest in health and its laws as they do in filthy lucre matters whilst they have healthy brains and bodies is the proper time to secure it for future enjoyment a wise rich man secures his money by safe investments according to the laws of finance equally so does a good wise healthy man study heed and obey the laws of life and health whilst he possesses the heavenly treasures whilst he has powers of discretion he secures it not only for his own selfishness but for the purpose of transferring it to his children and grandchildren which let me tell you is the richest and most glorious legacy that a parent can bequeath unto his children but as i glance around where do i find our good wise men according to this interpretation of wisdom looking at the negligence of the laws of life at the smoking chewing and snuffing poisonous tobacco loving this filth more than god son or spirit at the rum sipping and at the rage for worldly gain for wealth in the extremes of fantastic fashion in dress houses churches equipages and silly lavish expenditure in efforts to outdo or outshine one's foolish friends will any one verily can any decent person blame me if i ask the question are we an enlightened and christian community or do we go it blind are we even half civilized or moralized do we exhibit common sense certainly not good sound sense for this is the growth of judgment founded upon scientific knowledge and too few care to learn the path they should walk in alas alas the errors and follies of the fathers are copied by the children and the stultified ignorance of the ancestors is perpetuated in the descendants and in a physiological and christian sense we are all on the broad way to destruction of body soul and spirit indeed few if any ask themselves the question do i live aright are my habits of life in consonance with god's fixed laws of life and health such queries would indicate practical thought causing the reasoning faculties to bestir the befuddled brains which at this age of pharisaism sectarian piety and drug medication are carried in the stomach instead of the head hence saint and worldling reason that their stomachs want and actually need rum teas coffee grease oysters spices relishes fermented concentrated seasoned and refined fixings thus our so-called civilized people do not reason through the medium of or from their brains nor from data or sound principle else they would conclude that they should eat drink breathe exercise rest sleep dress act 
feel, and think solely for health purposes, and thereby obtain Christ's pure blood and body, when the gratification of one perverted propensity would be esteemed no more legitimate than another. Gluttony and licentiousness would be found to be twin brothers, whose munitions matter of the devil and his imps. Dear friends, notwithstanding all this perverseness of manner and discretion from natural laws, many sincere followers of the false prophets, who claim to possess vision and Christian virtues, profane the divine laws of life, by ridiculing and spurning simple food and natural drink, water, and call their pernicious and serpent-like appetites the voice of profound wisdom and learnedness. And whilst becoming kin to all the ills, sins, flesh, and lust of the devil, and with all this wickedness upon their heads, like my prosecutors and persecutors who sent me to prison, and even without a struggle for the right path, often cry aloud for blessings from the divine Creator, whom they have so shamefully disregarded, and I might appropriately exclaimed, Oh, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? However, with all the forenamed violation of God's laws, we boast of all this ingenious and enlightened nineteenth century. The general education of the people, the spread of knowledge among the millions, of steam engines, of railroads and telegraphs, of destructive war implements, of the triumphs of chemistry, of the wonders of the photographic art, but the highest of all arts, the art of living a natural Christ-like life, what can we boast? Oh, for a praying, church-going Christian community to take so little care in the art of living is a most shameful sin, a wretched blasphemy, and a gross infidelity to God's never-changing laws of life and health. Money and fleshly lusts that war against the soul seem to rule and control this whole machine of humanity, while sensualists and cutthroats, like Judge Sanctiblauer, sit on the judiciary bench to deal out damnation to those who vindicate the cause of God and mankind. Once more, in conclusion, permit me to ask you, who are the sovereigns of America? Shall these misled doctors and ministers tutor your minds in such a manner that you dare not protect him who has suffered already the severest persecution for the welfare of humanity? Have you a spark of the milk of human kindness left in your bones that will not exert itself to the utmost to aid me in subduing these vile conspirators? who claim to be licensed from on high to carry out their hell-born desires? Arise, O sons of earth, and strike for your inalienable rights, for your religious liberty, for your benefactors, for your health, for Jesus Christ, God, and mankind. Do this, and his will be done here in earth as it is there in heaven, and the millennium will will indeed be established. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 36. The Bloody Conspirators in Fear, and Fight Amongst Themselves. The Bloody Conspirators almost ran their movements into the ground, 
breaking their camel's back by causing the state legislature to make several offensive laws which however were only intended for victor juno and when a certain newspaper was printing sentiments in its columns that came within these laws and the friends of dr juno arrested the publisher of this sectarian newspaper they saw the blunder they made as their instigated enactments were nauseating to their own saints they called a very special meeting of the sacredly secret conclave to meet at tabernacle hall sharp at eight p m the president rev joe peer as usual called the saints to order and after the minutes of the preceding meeting were read a hot discussion took place about the reckless manner in which business is oftentimes transacted brother savage ragtag took the floor and said that he was arrested by some audacious scoundrel who is friendly to dr juno because he had published an advertisement of a certain celebrated patent medicine doctor which came within the law that the brotherhood had recently enacted for the special benefit of dr juno now then this law was so recklessly drawn up as to injure the business of many of the saints if enforced on them and there are enough rascals amongst us who make no scruples to spring our own trap on us which truly is breaking our camel's back influence must be brought to bear on the prosecuting officers to draw this charge of an obscene libel now pending against him for doing what all the other newspapers publish yes even the oracle prints this same patent medicine advertisement and in a measure it would serve brother generous right if they should arrest him also because he had been the leader in having this reckless law framed and enacted remember brethren i have no objections to any kind of law that will catch the renegade dr juno but i want it so cautiously framed as only to include quacks like him without touching decent people's business said savage ragtag to this onslaught by brother savage ragtag on gold eagle generous colonel mcstuckup pounced upon the floor and said mr president and holy saints i am not going to sit here and allow the libelous ragtag insult the memory of my noble employer whilst he is absent in europe brother generous is a christian and gentleman of the first water and he would give more money toward any of the saints good work as is often seen in the newspapers than this growing libeller can raise in a lifetime here deacon rob stew intervened and said mr president i ask you to call these green brethren to order at once because we cannot and shall not lose time in fighting over irrelevant matters for which this special meeting was called the brethren are out of order and brother stew must be heard responded the president the devil he must said savage ragtag and was going to continue speaking when a blow on his mouth sent him reeling like a top after which he crawled into a back seat and shut pan deacon rob stew now arose and said beloved saints if you are wise you will be silent and attentive whilst i endeavor to show you where great danger is breeding yes danger that may bring every one of us speedily to the gallows unless we plan and work like brave fellows oh brother stew please let us pray responded rev joe peer for i am scared already out of a year's growth bring every one of us speedily to the gallows great mars i feel choked already oh beloved brethren and sisters let us pray god to unite us in sentiment and action so that we shall escape the hangman's ignominious rope because i despise hemp when it comes too nigh to a saint's swallowing organs brother peer is right continued rob stew 
and it must be self-evident to all of you that dr juno the accursed innovator is gaining ground on us notwithstanding our endeavours to disgrace him by convicting and imprisoning him for publishing an obscene libel why the daredevil is actually making capital of his imprisonment by crying persecution and i have a report at home of two sermons that he has lately delivered to large intelligent audiences on ministers and doctors in which he shows without cavil that he is right and that we are all in the wrong his hearers i understand from the reporter whom i sent to get his speeches were perfectly carried away by his logic and eloquent manner even my faithful saintly reporter esteems juno to the greatest man living and if such loyal brethren as reporter sanctiblower son of judge sanctiblower are being carried away who is safe that is really intelligent provided dr juno is permitted to go on in his determined way the intelligent temperate classes of the people who are the most useful and respectable will soon join this innovator they respect him greatly and before long he will make a move to crush us by rebellion see if he don't unless we can remove him from our midst lord oh lord help help us sighed out reverend joe peer with uplifted hands and interrupting the deacon continued i feel it o oh brethren i feel it dr juno is arousing the best people and carrying them away from us and will surely be hung as common murderers oh 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 do not be such a coward mr president angrily cried out dr toy pansy i also know that a certain class of people will join dr juno but these are few compared with all those who are his bitter opponents now listen for a moment brother peer and don't be a fool both you and the deacon forget that we can swell our crowd to an immense army by calling all the medicine doctors medicine swallowers tobacco dealers rum dealers and the users of these articles also the jealous selfish miserly crowd will come to our side if we should ask them to do so and the public press is our slave already therefore take comfort and feel safe and sound oh dear good wise brother pansy you really are a doctor who can cure the weakness of the flesh by your deep thought and i now feel i am myself again ejaculated the saintly reverend joe peer mr president i am not a public speaker but i have a few words to say and that is that i am opposed to accept the services or be thrown into communion with unregenerate people like the dissipated worldlings who indulge in rum tobacco profanity sabbath breaking and so forth responded a sanctimonious brother silence interposed deacon rob stew and hear me we do not want your silly scruples on the habits of the worldlings or on any one else first because such nonsense comes too near the accursed teachings of dr juno and secondly because we shall need all the help that we can get from all quarters furthermore i call upon the president to order all such rebellious stuff as being irrelevant when we meet as a sacredly secret conclave and remind all who belong here that i say our solemn oath cannot be violated with impunity remember the fate of the apostate harry gossamer yes brothers and sisters remember the fate of the apostate harry gossamer whose death for dissenting with profound wisdom of deacon rob stew should be a terrible lesson to all of you who are within reach of my humble voice exclaimed the reverend joe peer i rise to request that brother rob stew shall finish his speech i want to hear his plans 
and if they do not agree with mine i shall take the opportunity to urge what i claim to be rational and will prove successful said sister nancy clover oh precious holy and profoundly wise sister clover your angelic voice always charms my soul and calms my fears and i now order that the floor belongs to brother stew until he has finished his speech exclaimed the saintly president with a countenance quite serene as he threw an affectionate glance at sister nancy clover brethren i know that we have only one way left us to carry us safely through israel said deacon rob stew and that is by working in unison with the politicians and worldlings generally we have reached that dangerous point when we cannot choose our company in fact we have not started right in the beginning but we cannot go back and do over what is already done therefore as our religion sanctions the moderate use of those things which physiological science totally rejects and as we have always indulged in the same worldly habits as those do who make no professions of piety why should we now at this eleventh hour object to cast our fortunes with drama drinkers tobacco indulgers money seekers gluttons sensualists warriors politicians and people of that kidney i boldly admit before the sacredly secret conclave that dr juno is right in the sight of god and science but in the sight of the people he is wrong and we cannot change the people's tastes without sacrificing millions and beginning with the unborn generations by starting communities as dr juno says and in those communities train the young to lead natural physiological lives and grow them sound in body and mind before they increase and multiply and replenish this wicked earth these sentiments i have learned recently from a sermon that i had reported which dr juno delivered in his own hall and whilst i must admit the soundness of his doctrines i say that such views do not suit the elect nay such work does not become an old established sainthood which is always called upon god for all its wants and blessings why brethren and sisters such teachings would ruin us body and soul therefore i say we require to be a unit in carrying our old established work fearlessly ahead and to prevent a crisis a war that will cause our downfall with the only source we can look to for succor i mean the people we must remove this dr juno this vile agitator of a cause that would have been worthy our best efforts had we understood it as this innovator does may i ask the brother a question said dr toy pansy certainly responded the deacon well sir if what you have just said be really true would it not be better and wiser for us to cease our erroneous work and instead of prosecuting long-established ungodly usages join dr juno and work with him he is very generous most benevolent and would forgive any injury if asked to do so what say the saints this reckless speech of deacon rob stew and the proposition by dr toy pansy caused a terrible hubbub amongst the brotherhood which resulted in a furious fight with fists chairs and knives end of chapter thirty six